Hello, amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I am back with A Way Through the Sea, which is by Robert Elmer, and this is a historical fiction, which means that it has made-up characters, but the events and the setting were largely true. The First Race Peter slept in a little. When he finally woke up, it wasn't to his alarm clock, but to something else. Out at the entrance to the harbor, the foghorn blasted every 19 seconds. He lay awake, counting the same way he had since he was a little boy. 17, 18, 19, blast. One, two, three, four, crack! He jumped out of bed, snapped up the shade, and threw open the window. Everything seemed drippy and clammy outside. Hey, are you trying to break the window or something? He yelled down at Henrik. Henrik was standing in the middle of the foggy street with his hands on his hips and a grin on his face. He was taller than Peter, maybe as tall as Elise, and he looked like a professional soccer player as he juggled a pebble between his feet. He was always grinning like that. And when he came to wake Peter up, it, he usually pretended not to know anything about the pebbles he threw up at the window to get Peter's attention. Peter scratched his head, looking down at the street. One of these days, he's going to break the window pane, and then he'll be sorry. You're just sleeping the day away, Henrik shouted back. It's late. Peter popped his head back inside, followed by a patch of cool fog. His alarm clock said seven. He pulled yesterday's slightly wrinkled shirt on before he leaned out again. What do you mean late, he shouted once more. You call seven late? I don't call seven on a Saturday morning late at all, said Mr. Anderson from the hallway. You can stop shouting out the window before you wake all the neighbors. From the sound of it, he was not kidding. Peter turned around and lowered his voice. Sorry he said to the door. And now that we're all awake, added Peter's mother, you can come out for breakfast. But we're going to take the birds out this morning on a race. Peter opened up his door to the hallway. Both his parents were standing there looking half asleep. How are you going to fly the birds anyway in this fog? asked his father. He was still in his pajamas. Peter went back over to the window again to check if there was any blue sky showing yet. There was, just a little. At least, it didn't look totally foggy. It'll burn off in an hour or so, Peter told his dad. That will give us enough time to bike out to Marin Marion List. The Marion List, Mary's Resort, was the grand old hotel north of the city, the one that looked out on the Sound and Sweden. To get there, Peter and Henrik would have to ride up the coast, past the famous Kronberg Castle. It was a ride they had made several times before with Elise. Hmm, said Mr. Anderson, scratching his morning beard. He still wasn't fully awake. Well, you better get something to eat before you leave and stay away from any soldiers out there. Peter nodded, barely paying attention. We have to hurry, though, he said. Henrik is waiting outside with the birds. The boys had decided to take their two birds in the basket. Let them go at the seaside resort and see which of the birds made it back to the coop first. Elise, who was reading a big book for school over the weekend, had said she didn't want to come this time, but she would judge the finish. It would cost Peter, though. Okay, but what will you give me if I do it, she had asked the day before, when they were trying to figure out how to do the race. I thought you would do it out of the goodness of your little sister's heart. He said, getting on his knees. Maybe, she crossed her arms and grinned down a little. But if I did it, it would be out of the goodness of my big sister's heart. <clears throat> Whatever, said Peter, clutching her ankles and untying her shoelaces. She yanked her foot out of the way. Oh, how about it, sweet, lovable, tall little sister? Peter ended up doing the dishes an extra day for Elise, which both of them thought was a pretty good trade. I still wish she would have volunteered, though, Peter mumbled to himself as he shoveled down a piece of bread with cheese and downed a glass of milk. 
There was a tapping on the door downstairs at the street, and he ran to his bedroom window again to tell Henrik to wait. His window was almost straight above the outside door. Come on, hurry up, Henrik kissed from the street below. He had the wicker fishing basket they used to haul for hauling the pigeons strapped to the back of his bike. One of the birds was poking its little head out of the small square hole on the top. Henrik was jumping up and down now, bouncing on his bicycle seat. Okay, okay, I'll be right down. Peter hurried down the hall to the small washroom, splashed some water on his face, then sprint, sprinted back to his bedroom. Elise still wasn't awake, or at least she hadn't moved yet from her bed when he peeked into the room. Sleepy head. Just in case she hadn't awakened, Peter slammed his bedroom door for effect. That worked. She started to roll over and make a noise. Pulling on a pair of pants and a gray sweater that his mother had knitted, he listened for her. Hey, Elise, are you awake? Peter hollered through the wall. No answer. Elise, wake up. You've got to be ready for the race, and we're leaving now. He thought she must be pretending not to hear. She was... She has to be awake by now. Come on, Elise. I'm not going to do your dishes for you if you don't come through for the race. He poked his head into her little closet of a room. At that, she sat up, looking very sleepy. When are you going to let them go, she asked, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. Elise was usually a morning person, but not today. It's going to take us about an hour to get up to the Marion List Hotel, he said, feeling more impatient every minute. Henrik is waiting. Maybe less if we go by the water. Henrik is outside with the birds right now. So what time again, she asked. Okay, listen, it's quarter to seven now. So we'll let them go around eight or eight fifteen, or as soon as it's all clear. Then it will only take number one and number two a few minutes to fly back. What if they take longer, she asked. What if they do? I don't know. Just be ready down at the boathouse to see which one makes it through the trap door first. Take a clock down with you, too, and write down what time the birds make it back. Okay, Peter, she grumbled, but you're making it too complicated for yourself. But not for your genius brain. Don't forget, I'm doing your dishes. Just be sure to get it right, okay? The second they poke their little heads into the trap door. Okay, okay, Mr. General, I get the message. Peter started for the door. Peter, is your friend still outside, asked his mother. Everybody was up by then, including Elise. You go tell Henrik to come in for something to eat if he hasn't already had breakfast. But, Mom, we got to get riding, he said, knowing he would not win the argument. Besides, she was heating up a little oatmeal on the stove, and it actually smelled pretty good. Maybe just a bite. Ride nothing. You're going to get something into your stomach besides a piece of bread. Now go get Henrik. A minute later, they were all wolfing down bowls of steaming oatmeal topped with a shot of milk. There was no butter to melt over it, but oatmeal was one thing the Anderson family seemed to have plenty of. No one had ever known Henrik to turn down a meal, even though, as he said between mouthfuls, we really ought to get going. Mrs. Anderson answered with another spoonful of oatmeal in their bowls. She didn't need to ask. By then, Peter's father had come shuffling out again, yawning and scratching his weekend stubble beard. He was a tall man, and his sandy hair always stood straight up when he first got out of bed. He sat down at the table with the boys to his own bowl of oatmeal. Out, she cried, fanning his mouth. That bite went down a little too quickly. You're as bad as the boys, scolded his wife. Now all of you slow down. It's not a race. That's exactly what it was, but Peter didn't say that to his mother. Henrik was already scooting his chair out from the table, and he would be down the stairs two at a time in a second. Thanks so much for the breakfast, Mrs. Anderson. At least he sounded polite, even if he did eat and run. Peter ran after him, down to where the family bikes were parked just inside the door at the foot of the stairs. There was a small, dark courtyard behind another door that opened to the street. The door slammed behind them, and the two boys were out in the narrow street, wheeling their way through the lifting fog. The race was finally going to happen. The old city sat by the ocean as if it belonged there, and it had for hundreds of years. 
ancient, leaning brick buildings huddled over the tiny streets. Streets that all seemed to run down to the harbor. They were paved with bumpy old cobblestones, the kind that made boys' teeth chatter when they rode over them. But it was only three turns and a couple of blocks before they made it to the main road leading out of town, St. Anne Street. It was fairly easy pedaling from there, and there weren't any cars on the road, only a few trucks, four gray German army cars, and a delivery van or two. Everyone else cycled, like Henrik and Peter, mainly because regular people hadn't been allowed to use their cars since the war started. Before they got far, though, Peter noticed the bird basket on the back of Henrik's bike starting to wiggle. It was coming loose from where he had tied it on the rack. Hey, Henrik, Peter called up to him. His friend was about five bike lengths ahead and picking up speed. The basket is coming loose, Henrik. But Henrik did not hear. So Peter pedaled faster, trying to catch up. His rubber hose of a tire only flapped harder, though and he had a terrible time keeping up. Dumb rubber hose, when are we going to get real tires again? The hoses were awful substitutes for real bicycle tires, but Peter had gotten used to them. Ever since the war had started, and even a little bit before that, no one in the whole country could get new tires for anything. The German war machine seemed to gobble up everything made of rubber. So when things wore out, like the tires, Peter and his family had to make do with homemade tires. Mr. Anderson came up with the idea of sewing together the ends of a rubber hose with heavy twine and a sailmaker's needle. And it worked, kind of. Peter and Uncle Morton, a fisherman, came up with the idea to use heavy rope braided together around the tire rim. Both inventions looked pretty silly, but it was better than riding on the rims, even though no one could go as fast on pretend tires. Peter would have liked to go a little faster. If Henrik didn't stop real soon, or at least turn around to check on the basket, the birds were going to take a tumble. Henrik! Hey, Henrik! Peter shouted. But by then, Henrik was out of sight, around a corner and pulling away. Sometimes I could just strangle him, if only I could catch him. Where are you going so fast? came a voice right behind Peter. Startled, he almost swerved off the street, which only made Henrik laugh and laugh. Hey, real funny, Peter said to him, slowing down. Where did you come from, anyway? I was just trying to catch up to tell you that the basket was falling off. Really? Henry sounded surprised, then stopped at the curb. While he had circled around through an alleyway, the basket had loosened even more. Somehow, it was still hanging on. Both boys looked in through the bird's square air hole, and the two pigeons were quietly holding on in the bottom of the basket. Peter tied the basket a little tighter, and they started down the road again. Only this time, Henrik, slow down, would you? Sorry. Peter wasn't sure, but Henrik sounded as if he meant it. The old city was soon behind them as they pedaled on up the coast. Off to the right in the distance was the ocean. It's never far from anywhere in Denmark. Peter could still see patches of fog here and there, but mostly there was blue sky now, and the sun seemed to brighten everything more each minute. Still, his hands were numb from the cold morning air rushing past the handlebars of his, bike, of his black bike. He gave them turns in his coat jacket, which helped a little. He even, and even though Henrik had slowed down, Peter still had trouble keeping up. Henrik looked back over his shoulder once in a while, checking to see if Peter was still there. Can't you go any faster, old man? called Henrik. Hey, show off, Peter replied. I've been keeping it slow so you wouldn't burn out your Olympic muscles. He may not have been as fast as Henrik on the bi bicycle, but he could keep pace with his teasing any day. We're almost there, Henrik yelled back, ignoring Peter's last remark. They were heading straight for the water now, and on the left was a large old Marion List Hotel, a local landmark. The place was known for its swimming beach, a gambling casino, and the great views of Sweden, just across the sound. It was a big, beautiful building, full of history, and the boys liked to bike out here for the ride. It seemed so far away from their home in the city, even though it really wasn't a long bike ride away. Henrik was waiting on the steps of the Grand Ole Hotel as Peter pedaled up. He had taken his map out of his knapsack and was studying it.
They both could find their way around this part of Denmark with their eyes closed, but Henrik always brought a map along anyway. Here's how I figure it, he said, holding the map close to his face. If we let the birds go here, they'll both go straight back to the boathouse, like this. He traced his family across the map, tra traced his finger across the map, straight across the old city and over to the other side. We'll let them both go on the count of three. Wait a minute, Peter interrupted. If we do that, they'll both fly together and they'll just keep close to each other. We won't find out which bird is faster that way. Henrik looked up, disgusted. Why didn't we think of that before, he asked. I'll bet the brain would have known if she had been here. I don't know about that, said Peter, but let's think of a way to get them far enough away from each other so that they fly by themselves. It still has to be fair. They looked around trying to figure out a way. Look, said Peter, pointing to a big rock down by the beach. If you took your bird way down there, then we could still both let them go at the same time. No, it'll never work, Henrik said after a minute. They'll catch up to each other and then just fly together. Peter knew he was right. The birds did have a way of finding each other, even when they were flying blocks away. Then a light went on in his head and he remembered something. I've got it, said Peter, pounding Henrik on the shoulder. We'll just give one of the birds a handicap. Yeah, that's perfect. Henrik wrinkled his nose and squinted. That was his. I don't get it. Look. A handicap, he asked. That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. You mean like tying a rock to its legs? Not a physical handicap, silly. Peter was enjoying having a good idea for once. Maybe it was because his sister wasn't along. She was usually the one who figured out all the secret plans and things like that. All we do is let one of the pigeons fly just like we planned, but we hold on to the other one and then, like five minutes later, we let the other one go. Then, when we get back, we just use a little math to figure out which one came back the fastest. Not too complicated at all. Peter folded his arms, sure that he had a great idea. Actually, he remembered reading about it in a pigeon racing book called Pigeon Racing for a Hobby, by Victor something. Your sister will know? Sure she will. Besides, I told her to write down the time the birds come in. I think she'll write it down for both of them. She'll. He didn't want to admit it to Henrik, but Elise was the one who had shown him the book a few months ago and explained the whole idea first. Okay, I get it, said Henrik. If number one gets back first and then number two gets back in less than five minutes, number two wins. And if it takes exactly five minutes for number two to get back, then it's a tie. But that won't happen, said Peter. No, well, then if it takes more than five minutes for number two to show up, which it will, number one would win, finished Peter. But for sure, that won't happen. Right. Henrik scratched his chin, thinking, well, maybe there's another way to do it. They both stood there for a minute, not saying anything, thinking some more. Peter was going over the five-minute part again, making sure his math was right. Do you have any better ideas? Peter finally asked. No, but the only problem is neither of us has a watch to time the birds with. No problem, said Peter, pointing up at the hotel. In there, there is a large grandfather clock behind the counter in the wood-paneled lobby, perfect for what they needed. A lot of these kinds of inns had a big clock out front. The clerk behind the counter looked at the boys with his eyebrows raised, probably wondering why two 11-year-old boys would come into his hotel and stare down the hour. Pigeon race, said Henrik, as if that would explain everything. He was holding the wicker basket with both birds under his arm. Is that clock right? Last time I said it, replied the man, looking at his own wristwatch to check. He was probably as old as Peter's grandfather and even looking a lot like him with little puffs of gray hair around his ears and a friendly expression in his eyes. Can I help you boys with something? We have to let one of the birds go at exactly eight o'clock, explained Peter, and then the next one will go five minutes later. Birds? asked the innkeeper, eyeing the basket under Henrik's arm. Peter nodded. Maybe he's never seen homing pigeons like ours before. Oh yeah, said Henrik. Homing pigeons. We're racing them back to Helsinger. Oh, the man nodded. Like they used to 
use in the last war for sending secret messages. He looked interested enough, probably as long as they didn't let the pigeons go in his hotel. That was before they had radios, the way they have today. Soldiers would send their messages back and forth with these birds, just the same way you are doing now. Of course, he continued his story. For your sake, I'm glad there aren't any German soldiers nosing around the hotel this morning. Yes, and H Hendrik asked, why? The birds aren't illegal, are they? Illegal? No, said the man. Then he lowered his voice as if he were telling them some kind of secret. But those Germans are always asking questions. And whenever they start asking questions, the rest of us get in trouble. There's no use getting into trouble over something like your pets there. If you boys know what I mean. Peter didn't know what he meant. Not quite. The birds? Illegal? Henrik and Peter just stood there and stared at the innkeeper. Henrik's eyes were big, as if he were thinking about what the man had just said. Well, come on, boys, said the man, looking down the hall at a guest. Let's launch those birds and see what happens. Peter looked through the lobby at the, out the front door. Henrik put down the basket, propped the door open with a rock, and walked out carefully with number one in his hands. A minute till eight. At the first bong of the clock, Peter waved his hand, and Henrik tossed the bird into the air. Peter and the innkeeper trotted out as number one circled briefly over the hotel roof, around the gardens and the beach, and then headed straight back down the coast. Peter could hear his wings whistling. The bird would be home in just a few minutes. How much do you want to bet number one is the first one back to the coop? Henrik said as the three of them walked back into the empty hotel lobby. Suddenly, a green-uniformed German soldier walked up behind Henrik. He must have just come around from the other side of the building. Henrik nearly jumped out of his skin when he saw who was right beside him. Excuse me, please, said the grim-faced soldier. He didn't seem much older than 20 or so. Blonde and crew cut. He walked in as if he didn't know his way around very well, stepped past Henrik, and went right to the counter. He looked impatiently at the old man, drumming his fingers on the big walnut counter as he spoke in a mixture of broken Danish and German. Peter strained to understand the conversation. Something about getting directions or trying to find out about the best way to get to Gallipolehe, a popular spot for tourists up the coast. What's he saying? The old innkeeper, now behind the counter, only returned an icy stare. Sorry, he said in Danish. I don't think I follow what you're saying. He made no attempt to slow down to let the soldier understand better. Instead, he was talking as quickly as he could. My German is pretty rusty. They went back and forth like that for almost a minute. The soldier frowned, waved his hands, and tried to mix in a little more Danish. The innkeeper didn't slow down for a second, doing his best to frustrate the young soldier. Any other time, it would have been almost funny for Henrik and Peter to watch. This time, though, they slipped out the door into the sunshine. Wow, said Peter. You almost jumped through the ceiling when he came up on you like that. I think we'd better get out of here. Instead, Henrik looked straight back at his friend, and his eyebrows clamped down on his forehead. No way, he said. We didn't come all this way to only let one bird go. But you heard the innkeeper, didn't you, said Peter. Uh, but he looked back at the hotel and shivered. We should be back home. How they used to use pigeons for sending secret messages during the last war? What if that German guy sees our bird and... Don't worry about it, Henrik interrupted, wearing the same determined expression. This was not the carefree Henrik anymore. Nothing will happen. We're just a couple of kids, remember? All you have to do is get back in there and watch for the time. When it's exactly five after eight, bend down and tie your shoe. I'll just go around the corner real quick and let number two go. Then he pulled number two out of the basket, holding the speckled gray bird firmly. Peter felt his heart pumping double time, but he sucked in his breath, went back into the hotel, and sat down in a soft chair. Why don't we just go home? The soldier was ha still waving his arms at the innkeeper, but the old man was sticking to his act looking as if he couldn't understand a word. Peter peeked up from the behind a magazine and checked the clock. Four minutes after, there was no time to think about how stupid he was for coming back in. As soon as the big hand hit five, he quietly padded over close to the door, 
bent down and pretended to tie his shoe. Henrik saw him from outside, nodded and disappeared around the corner from, with the bird. He was holding it behind his back by then. Just then, the soldier threw up his hands for the last time in disgust, exhaled something in pure steely German, wheeled around, and stared straight at Peter. Peter's shoes felt as if they were glued to the floor, but the soldier just looked past him and went for the door. It all happened in an instant, too late to warn Henrik, but the look on Peter's face told the innkeeper all he needed to know. The birds may not have been illegal, but the soldier was sure to notice. Were they for messages? Who gave permission? And what is your name? Henrik Melikor, the Jew, was the last person who needed to get into trouble with the German soldier. A second later, the innkeeper was calling the soldier back. Wait a minute, please, he said in perfect German. I just remembered a shortcut you might be interested in. The soldier, who was just pushing open the door, stopped in his tracks and glanced over his shoulder in, su shoulder in surprise. The expression on his face turned from puzzled to angry, but he wheeled around and came back in. Peter nodded in relief to the innkeeper behind the counter and hurried out. The soldier brushed by him again, going the opposite direction. Peter didn't look up or even breathe until he was outside again with the door closed behind him. Number two was still circling higher and higher overhead. Hey, how about that, said Henrik, smiling, as Peter rounded the corner of the building. He is back to his old self, right under his nose. That wasn't funny, Henrik, said Peter. You don't know how close we came to getting in big trouble. He told him how the innkeeper had kept the soldier from going out when Henrik was letting the bird go. Yeah, but what could he have done? Henrik was putting on a good show. They both knew or guessed what the soldier could have done. I don't know, but we, were you ready to find out? Hey, I could have told Air Corporal all about the top secret intelligence gathering spy bird, right? Henrik had one leg over his bike again, ready to go. That's Henrik, thought Peter, always on the edge. Someday that's going to get us in real live trouble, never mind the fact that he's Jewish. Just having been so close to a German soldier made Peter kind of shaky. He wondered if Henrik felt like that. He had to, but then again, maybe not the way he talked. Then Peter remembered how scared Henrik had looked just for a second when the innkeeper had told him his story. Henrik looked over his shoulder to see if Peter was coming, and they pedaled away. See that guy's motorcycle parked over there behind the building, Henrik yelled. Peter glanced back over at the hotel. A motorcycle with a sidecar was still there under the shade of the birch tree. That was why they hadn't seen the soldier pull up to the hotel. I see it. We should have gotten some sugar from the hotel and put it in his gas tank. Wreck the engine. You're not serious, said Peter. That would have thrown the old innkeeper in jail and tossed away the key. Us too. He was a nice guy. Here I am still shaking and Henrik is cracking sabotage jokes. Peter pedaled as fast as he could. All he wanted was to get back home, away from the Marion List Hotel. Who was a nice guy? The Nazi? Henrik teased. Anyway, I heard that pouring varnish into a car's oil is even better. Starts right up, runs smoothly, but once it cools down, the varnish dries all inside the engine. You can never start it again. Peter didn't say anything, but just kept pedaling. The ocean was on their left now, and the coastline of Sweden was clearly visible across the water. Here and there, a fishing boat bobbed around in the waves. Peter thought one of the boats would have been his uncle's. But this time they weren't sightseeing, and they didn't stop to explore any beaches either. Both of them were pedaling fast to get back to Grandfather's boathouse. As usual, Henrik was right out in front, and Peter was puffing pretty hard, trying to keep up. Their tr tires were keeping time. Kathunk, kathunk, kathunk. Hey, Henrik. Peter wheezed between breaths. Don't you think the birds are going to beat us anyway? P Henrik looked back with his usual grin. Number one was all he said. It seemed as if he was barely breathing hard, even though he was pedaling fast enough to keep ahead of Peter. Huh? Peter shot back. It was hard for him to get annoyed with, Peter, with Henrik for anything, especially when his friends started grinning and clowning. You're crazy. Number two is going to beat your bird by an hour. 
So they both crouched down, pedaling faster and faster as they pulled into the city. They passed the small boat harbor on the north side of the city, where the swimming pier was. That used to be a busy place, but the Germans made anyone with a pleasure boat keep it tied up, just like they made people lock up their cars. Then right on Green Garden Street, left at St. Anne's, and past the huge steeples of the old St. Mary's Cathedral, Catholic Church, there were in, they were in the city now, racing as fast as they dared through the narrowing streets. The city was built way before cars came around, and the streets in some neighborhoods were almost narrow enough to hop across in one big jump. If you didn't mind the bumpy ride, they were perfect for bikes. Elise better be there after all this, said Peter to no one in particular. Henrik just looked ahead and hunched over his handlebars like a professional bike racer. They sped down St. Anne's spray straight for the inner harbor where grandfather's neat little boathouse perched on the waterfront. Peter seemed to get his second wind or else Henrik slowed down because they pulled up wheel to wheel in front of the little shed. They jumped off their bikes let them roll against the wall by the side of the door and burst in. Elise was sitting on the workbench in between cans of paint and a pile of rope boat fenders. The kind grandfather braided together to protect the sides of boats. Her nose was in a book and she didn't even look up. Henrik and Peter both stood there, gasping, catching their breath. Well, said Peter between breaths, he could tell both birds were back in the cage part of the house. They were doing their usual thing, strutting, making pigeon sounds with the other birds. Well, what? said Elise from behind the book. She was acting as if she didn't care, but Peter could see her grinning. She turned a page. Come on, you know which bird made it inside first, he re replied Peter, getting impatient. Elise always teases us like this, he thought, and we always play along, especially Henrik. This time, I want to find out. Okay, let's see, she said slowly. It was the one that has checkered feathers. That's number one, right? You know that's number two, snapped Peter. Or was it the one with the pretty little bars across the back, Elise flashed, that annoying smile of hers. Come on, Elise, stop teasing, pleaded Henrik. Even he was getting impatient. You promised, added Peter. Remember the dishes? Well, it was close, she finally admitted, but number one was the first one through the trap door. Yeah, whooped Henrik, pulling his fist down like a conductor with a steam whistle. I knew number one would live up to his name. Not so fast, Henrik, said Peter. Did you forget about the handicap? Henrik frowned. We let number one go first, remember? To really win, we'd have to win more than five minutes. So how long did it take before number two showed up? Peter was crossing his fingers, hoping that Elise had paid attention. Well, since I knew you had asked that question, said his sister, I brought along father's pocket watch, and I have an exact clock in time. She was drawing this out for all it was worth. Looking down at her dad's old watch in her hand, she pronounced the final verdict. Number one came in the door five minutes and 47 seconds ahead of number two. Ha, said Henrik. We won by almost a minute. Now he was really grinning. By this time, Peter had gathered his bird from the cage and he held her between his hands. He loved the way the feathers on the bird's neck glimmered blue-green. Oh, well, he whispered to the bird. You did your best. It was only 47 seconds. Congratulations, he said to Henrik. So how about a rematch tomorrow? Only next time, let's let them go at the same time, just to see what happens. At the castle, with number three, said Elise. I'm almost finished with this book I have to read. You're both on, said Henrik, tomorrow afternoon. So they're going to have another little race. And next time we'll read chapter four, A Visit with Holger the Dane. And this is Grandma Carla, and I love you.